Great, nice to see so many people here, especially on such a sunny day. It must be <laughs> have been a tough decision to sit inside or go outside. Um, you will be on mute, um, just so we don't have people talking in background noise at the same time. Um, what will happen is Peter, our speaker today, will give his talk, and then after that, you're going to get a chance to ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, we usually do that by the chat function, um, which you'll be able to find towards the bottom of your screen if you've not used Zoom before, um, and just hit the chat button and the chat box should come up. Uh, great. For now, though, um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Peter Morwell. Uh, I had met him for the first time when he moved to this campus actually to study pathogen evolution for his postdoc now. Um, before that, in his PhD at the Open University, he researched astrobiology, which is why we're here now. So over to you, please, Peter. Okay, I'll share the screen. That's the right one. Cool. Can I check that you guys can see this before I start going? Yeah, okay, yes. Great. Cool. So, as was just said, I'm currently working at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus, where I'm researching the evolution of social pathogens. What I'm going to be talking today about the work I was previously doing during my PhD, where I was investigating the habitability of Martian salt crystals. So, as mentioned, my PhD was in astrobiology. And what exactly is astrobiology? You hear the words astrobiology, and the very first thing that comes to mind is something like this. Ast is, most people tend to think, Astrobiology is searching for little green men. And is astrobiology all about searching for aliens? Well, yes, but actually no. In a very real sense, astrobiology is tends to be broken down in the current day and age into two key branches. The first branch studies life. What is it? Where does it come from? How do we define it? And how do we detect it? The second branch of astrobiology investigates habitability. Again, how do we define it? And what are the rules that actually govern what makes a habitable environment? So the reason that we tend to focus on these areas rather than looking for life directly really comes down to the Viking mission in the 1970s. So this is a great photo of the Viking, one of the Viking landers taken next to Carl Sagan. And the big goal of this mission was to settle once and for all the question of is there life on Mars? And as you can see, it really failed at this goal of determining the issue once and for all, because 50 years later, we still don't have any sort of better idea as we had when Viking was launched. So Viking had three key instruments on it, and each of them was going to give a definitive yes or no answer as to whether it was detecting life. The first instrument said, yes, we're definitely detecting life. The second instrument said, no, we're definitely not detecting life. And the third instrument gave a weird answer that wasn't sort of a yes or no, but somewhere in between. So that was Viking, and that was where we sort of the last attempt we really had to try and directly detect alien life. And this is because Viking had three key problems with it that we're only now really getting to grips with dealing with. So the first problem, probably the most important one in terms of actually the experiments they did have, was that in the 1970s, the Martian environment was poorly understood. This was one of the very first missions to Mars. And at the time, we didn't know quite how different a planet Mars was to Earth. So we've actually now, since then, we've launched a lot of rovers, we've launched a lot of stationary landers, and we've had a lot of orbiters go to Mars. And since then, we've got a much better idea of what the actual surface conditions are like. We now know, based on what the soil on Mars is actually like, that if, we'd run those ex that if we run these experiments on Mars, the second experiment, the one that said no, it wasn't detecting life, would always fail to detect life in Martian soil. And we also know why the third experiment failed. This sort of does leave only one experiment out of three remaining, and this one does actually theoretically claim it detected life. But given the, the how poorly the other experiments went, not many astrobiologists are prepared to pit their neck out and say, yes, Viking did actually detect alien life. We want to go back and try this again with our more modern understanding. And really, this is one of the main goals of ESA's ExoMars mission. The Rosalind Franklin rover was meant to be launching this year, and it was meant to be repeating some of these experiments. And again, for the first time since Viking, really actually attempting to directly detect life on Mars. But then coronavirus happened, and now I think ESA ExoMars Rosalind Franklin isn't meant to land on Mars now until 2022. So watch this space. It might have some interesting results. Well, it will have interesting results. So the second issue with Viking was this idea that life was poorly defined. 
it was only really capable of detecting things that were relatively similar to terrestrial life. And the third issue with Viking is if you actually look at the rover, it's a stationary lander. It doesn't have wheels on it, which means it's really only restricted to investigating life in the immediate vicinity of the landing site. And I'll touch on these two issues in slightly more detail. So why is it important to actually know what life is? And this is because we can't detect alien life if we don't know what life itself is. There's a lot of people tend to take the approach of life of, I know it when I see it. And this works when identifying things like elephants or whales as being living beings, but it gets a lot more complicated when we're dealing with microorganisms. So the strategy employed by Viking, and again, the strategy that will be employed by ExoMars and probably any future life detection missions in the next few decades, was trying to detect things that are common to terrestrial life. So certain features that all life on Earth has in common. They all use nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, as the means of storing their genetic code. They all use ATP as an energy storage molecule, and they all use carbon as the basis of their metabolism. But these are just things that are the case on Earth. And all of these things could perhaps not be the case in alien planets. So if you look at this molecule here on the right, this looks like DNA, but actually this is an artificially generated molecule in the lab, and it uses six bases rather than four for storing its genetic code. But this does seem to work if you splice it into a, into a model organism. So you don't actually necessarily need to use only four bases in your genetic code. On a more complicated level than that, you don't even necessarily need to use nucleic acids at all. Back before we discovered that DNA was the source of the genetic code on terrestrial organisms, there were other theories proposed, including using amino acids for where the genetic code was stored, including amino acids, protein sequences, membrane chains. And while these didn't turn out to be the case, be it is DNA on Earth, these theories do sort of seem to, well scientifically valid. And it's possible that on another planet, which doesn't have the evolutionary history which Earth does, that maybe we could get some of these weird and wonderful systems working. ATP is used as the energy storage molecule for all life on Earth, but this is just because it was adopted by a really early primitive life form. And all life on Earth is descended from that one specific life form. If that life form had used a different energy storage molecule, or of a different life form in the primordial sea that used a different energy storage molecule had instead been slightly more effective, we would all be using a completely different molecule. And it cannot be assumed that ATP is the only thing that works. In terms of carbon metabolism, this is more clear cut than the other two examples. We've done lots of biochemical modeling and these all do seem to suggest that carbon is the best element you can use as the basis for metabolism. That said, while it is the best, it isn't the only one. And if you had a really cold world and there wasn't much carbon present, there are models to suggest you could get a functioning life form working based on silicon rather than carbon. So if we can't define life based on what life is made of, can we define life based on what it does? So a very simplistic definition of life, but probably the closest we're going to get, is this idea that life is, life is a replicating being that is subject to Darwinian evolution. But even then, that's a simplistic definition and it doesn't cover everything. There are a lot of things that fit this definition that we're pretty certain aren't alive. For example, machine learning algorithms commonly use some element of Darwinian evolution in the way they trim different pathways. But no one's really suggesting that the catchphrase you have to enter to prove you're not a robot when logging into things are living beings. On a more esoteric level, there are some cosmological theories that suggest that the universe exists as part of a multiverse with all the universes replicating based and, and subject to Darwinian evolution. But I don't think any scientists are seriously proposing that the universe is a living being. Some hippies maybe, but not scientists. On a much more granular level than the universe, we then get to the issue of viruses. Are viruses alive? This is an incredibly controversial topic. People will argue about this for hours and get more and more passionate about this. I know for a fact that there's at least one astrobiology conference that's banned discussion of the question of whether viruses are alive outside that specific topic of the conference, because otherwise you can't get anything else done. On a personal note, the last time I gave a science cafe, I raised this issue of are viruses alive? And then the question section afterwards, you send the two audience members shouting at each other over the issue of are viruses alive? People have strong opinions on this matter, and really there isn't any sensible way of setting it. So why, so why are we studying habitability? 
The reason astrobiologists study habitability is because if we're going to look for microbes, we need to know where to look. If we're looking at something like Mars, at this point we're pretty certain there's no large scale macro, macro life there. If we look further out in the solar system, especially some of the icy moons, this might not be the case. It's possible you could get organisms equivalent to fish down in these moons, but we're not going to be able to investigate them for decades. So really, looking at Mars, we need to look for microbes. And if we're searching an entire planet for microbes, we really need to work out in advance where the best place to look is, otherwise it's going to take you centuries. So in order to investigate what the best place to look for life on Mars is, we study extremophiles. These are terrestrial organisms that, as the name implies, survive extreme environments. By investigating what, on, what environments on Earth life can survive in and what environments on Earth life can't survive in, we can attempt to try and work out what life can actually cope with and work out where on an alien planet we could potentially find life. If we can find an extraterrestrial environment in which terrestrial life can survive, this seems a very good place to look for life. It is vitally important to stress, however, that this is based on terrestrial life. Just because we find a Martian environment that turns out to be habitable, it doesn't mean that it will be inhabited. Conversely, if we search the entirety of Mars and we can't find any environments in which terrestrial life can't, can survive, it doesn't mean that Martian life couldn't survive there. However, studies of extremophiles can try and work out the less hostile areas of Mars and thus the best places to look. So what is Mars actually like? This is a great image taken by the Curiosity rover. I really love this image, but it doesn't really actually capture just how brutal an environment Mars is. So Mars has no ozone layer. Its core has long since solidified, so it's got no magnetic field, and it's got a very thin atmosphere. And all this means that the surface is heavily bombarded by radiation from space. Um, furthermore, because we've got a very thin atmosphere, there's no greenhouse effect. And also you've got a solid, not cold core. And as a result, the temperatures on Mars are very, very cold. The warmest the temperatures get is around 20 degrees. The coldest it gets is about minus 125. But even this range of temperatures isn't so much an issue as how variable it is. In a lot of places on the Martian surface, during the summer months, your temperatures can vary by about 50 degrees in a given day. So Mars is cold, but still very variable in its temperature. We cannot acclimatise to the temperatures easily. Famously, Mars is very dry. The search for liquid water on Mars has dominated the discourse on Mars for decades. The reason for this is that you've got a very thin atmosphere, which encourages water to evaporate and become water vapour. And you've got very cold temperatures, which encourages water to freeze. And as a result, with this pressure to freeze or become water vapour, there's very little opportunity for water to actually remain liquid for any length of time. So generally, this doesn't paint a picture of a very habitable world. But Mars in the present day doesn't represent what the planet has always looked like. So we've got abundant evidence on the Martian surface that Mars used to have rivers and lakes. There's some evidence to suggest that Mars used to have seas, and there are even some planetary scientists who suggest that the entire northern hemisphere of Mars was once one giant ocean. So in these days, when Mars, Mars was able to have a lot more water in this distant past, mainly because the core had not solidified at this point and it was still warm. So the heat from the warm core heated up the surface, but also provided a magnetic field, which kept trapped an atmosphere in there, which provided a greenhouse effect. And this also has the useful effect that the warm core and the thicker atmosphere allowed there to be protection from the radiation on the Martian surface. So actually, four billion years ago, Mars resembled quite similarly Earth in the same sort of time period. In fact, NASA has officially declared that four billion years ago, Gale Crater, which is where the Curiosity rover is hanging out, it's where this photo was taken, four billion years ago, Gale Crater was a habitable lake. In fact, if we actually look at the geological history of Mars and compare it to Earth, the time period in which life first appeared on Earth, Earth had just been hit by some massive unknown object, a sort of massive cataclysm that created our moon. This melted huge chunks of the terrestrial surface. And actually, at the time in which life first appeared on Earth, Earth was not a very habitable world compared to Mars. Mars was a lot more pleasant place to be. So if life was on Earth at that point, why couldn't we have had life on Mars at the same time? So if Mars had life, what happened to it? Well, there were three main trajectories it could have taken. The first and the most boring 
There's the fact that if life, that Mars might have had life in the distant past, but couldn't survive into the present day, and Mars is now a dead world. Even so, if you could find evidence that Mars used to have life, this would drastically change our understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. And finding evidence of this doesn't actually seem as hard as you might first think. We don't have much evidence for life in the very early periods of Earth, but this is because of two key factors. Firstly, Earth's tectonic activity melts ancient rocks and creates newer rocks. Mars's core has solidified, so this doesn't happen on Mars, which means you've got a lot older rocks on Mars than you do on Earth. Secondly, the number one sort of thing that destroys ancient life on Earth is more recent life eating it up. If life on Mars was completely extinct, there would be no later life to destroy the evidence of this ancient life. So again, this could be relatively well preserved on Mars. The second option as to what could have happened on life on Mars is that it could have retreated to the subsurface. Personally, I think this is the most likely option. The Martian subsurface is a lot warmer than the surface because if you go underground into a planet, you still retain heat from the core. It's solidified, but it's still a lot warmer than the surface. Secondly, if you get the UV radiation can only penetrate a couple of centimeters of rock, whereas the cosmic radiation from space can only cover a couple of meters. So if you get deep into the Martian core, you are protected from the radiation. On Earth, pretty much everywhere we look underground where we find water, we find life. And the Martian subsurface seems pretty similar to the terrestrial subsurface. So it stands to reason that you could get life surviving on Mars. The big, well, not the problem with this theory, but the problem of proving this theory is actually getting to it. I want to say there are three drills on Mars, but I might be slightly off on that number. These drills are only a couple of, can only get a couple of meters deep, and they are very fiddly, and they are prone to breaking down and damaging their instrument. If we actually want to investigate the Martian subsurface properly to look for life, we're not going to be able to do this until at least after we've had manned, had humans on the surface of Mars. So the third option, and potentially the most exciting, is the fact that life on Mars could have adapted to the changing conditions. We do not know of any terrestrial life form that could survive on the Martian surface, but no terrestrial life form has been gradually exposed to the Martian environmental conditions over a period of billions of years. Mars used to be more habitable and life could have evolved as these conditions worsened. If we actually think of evolutionary history on Earth, something similar happened here. We don't tend to think of it because our, we are so used to our environment, but we actually are extremophiles that cope in an environment that was very, very extreme to the first life on Earth. The first life on Earth needed temperatures of about 38 degrees pretty much constantly. It needed strong water pressure around it, it needed the vaguely acidic conditions of oceanic vents, and most importantly, oxygen was incredibly toxic to it. When oxygen first appeared in our atmosphere, this very nearly wiped out all life on Earth in a process called the Great Oxygenation Event. We are descended from the few microorganisms that could survive oxygen-rich environment. We are all oxygen extremophiles. If life on Earth could adapt to these incredibly hostile conditions, the point where you and I don't even think of them as hostile, why couldn't life on Mars have done the same? So for life to survive on Mars in the present day, these are the key features it needs to have. It needs to be radiation resistant because Mars is bombarded with radiation. It needs to be desiccation resistant because any liquid water on Mars doesn't last very long. This GIF here on the right, these are objects called RSL, or occurring slope lineae. They appear on Martian slopes in the summer months, and probably the best theory as to what they are is that they are streams that form the temperatures get just right, but as soon as the environmental conditions change, they evaporate again. So this is really the best evidence we have of any sort of actually moderately sized bodies of liquid water on Mars, but they are very short lived. And any life on Mars in the present day needs to be able to survive high concentrations of salt, because the only way you can get things like these RSL forming and have them be liquid is if they have a very high salt concentration. So thankfully, we have a an example of a type of terrestrial organism that fits all these requirements. These are the halophiles, which as the name implies, are salt lovers. So halophiles are what I was studying in my PhD. And in particular, I was studying this process they undergo called entombment. So when brines evaporate, when salt lakes evaporate, you leave behind salt crystals. This is the process by which we generate sea salt for your fish and chips. 
When these salt crystals form, you get tiny pockets of water inside them called fluid inclusions. Um, I'm not sure whether you can actually see this image of them on the right because it's slightly blocked by different people's faces on the zoom, but if you move that slightly side to side, you can see a really good photo of them. They're about 0.5 micrometers thick and uh, 0.5 micrometers big. So they're very, very small. But when the salt crystals form, halophiles within the salty environment that's forming the salt crystals, they don't want to be left behind when the water goes. They instead get themselves trapped inside the fluid inclusions. And in this image, you can see the dyed, dyed halophiles are able to light up the surroundings of the fluid inclusions around them, which I think is a really beautiful photo. So once a halophile is inside a fluid inclusion, it can survive in there for a very long time. We're not quite certain how long a halophile can survive inside a fluid inclusion. Tens of thousands of years at this point is uncontroversial. There are reports, however, of hundreds of millions of years, perhaps even longer. Even then, once a halophile does eventually die inside the fluid inclusion, it should be noted that the environment of a fluid inclusion is a very good environment for preserving dead microbes. So halophiles survive a very long time inside the fluid inclusion, and then when they die, their remains survive an even longer time. So halophiles and entombment is really interesting in terms of Mars, because if you look at a map of this map of Mars here on the right, each of these red dots represents an ancient Martian salt lake. And we know this is an ancient Martian salt lake because it has left behind a massive Martian salt, massive salt deposit. So the th theory goes, that, when Mar that these ancient salt lakes could have contained organisms analogous to halophiles. When they evaporated, the organisms within them got themselves trapped inside the salt crystals, just waiting for us to go up, dissolve the salt crystals, and look for evidence of ancient life within them. So it's also really interesting in terms of Mars, that we know that once you stick a halophile inside a salt crystal, they become considerably better protected from surface radiation than a microorganism just sitting on the surface. So these seem a really good place to look for preserved ancient Martian life either dead or potentially still alive if we're very lucky. So there is, however, a big problem with this theory. And that is when the biologists say salt, when they talk about how much halophiles love salt, they mean sodium chloride, because this is the only salt that really matters on Earth. It's the only salt we have abundantly here. But when planetary scientists say salt, they can mean any one of a vast number of different ionic compounds. So, there is some evidence however to suggest that these ancient Martian salt lakes are sodium chloride. I'm slightly skeptical of these figures because they would suggest that on a planet like Mars, which has lots of different types of salt, you somehow manage to get salt deposits that are pure sodium chloride than any salt deposit on Earth, which is mostly sodium chloride. And if you actually look into the maths that goes into how these, why we think these are sodium chloride, there's a lot of assumptions being made there that I don't think quite shake out. But even if you assume that these salt deposits are sodium chloride, they do have problems if you want to try and investigate them with Mars rovers in the next few decades. So firstly, your rover can only land somewhere it gets too, that doesn't get too cold in winter, which means your Mars rover can only really explore within this red box. So you've immediately narrowed out a huge number of the salt deposits, which in this map are marked white, rather than red as in the previous map. Secondly, your Mars rover can only land on lowlands. It cannot land on hills. It's got to land somewhere that's relatively shallow. So you've got more air to fall through before you hit the ground. So it's going to pretty much restrict you to just investigating the salt deposits within this red dot box. There is, however, a third issue, which isn't science or engineering, it's politics, which is that if you want to go and do science on Mars, you're sending a Mars rover to Mars. This is billions of dollars you want to maximize the research you can do. If you're sitting there saying, I want to send this instrument to Mars, and by the way, it can only land, investigate within this tiny little box, they're more likely to say, we're not sending your instrument, we're sending one that we can do somewhere else. So can you investigate halophiles elsewhere on Mars, outside of this box? Well, the answer is potentially, because every single Mars rover has found abundant salts in their immediate vicinity but these definitely haven't been sodium chloride. These have been primarily magnesium, iron, sodium, and potassium salts, and they've been perchlorates and sulfates. These don't represent ancient salt lakes, like the vast sodium chloride deposits. These instead represent ancient hydrothermal vent systems that have evaporated and have been scattered around the surface of the planet via winds over billions of years. Can halophiles survive within these ancient hydrothermal vent systems, and can they survive entombed within the salts they fought? 
Well, we don't really know is the answer to that, I'm afraid. There is, however, this hot new word in the science community. This is exophiles. And this is this idea that you can get some halophiles that are more tolerant to magnesium salts than, other, than your average halophile. And at the moment, these are theoretical. There's a lot of research going on in them, and a lot of people are very excited at the possibility they might exist. So I wanted to investigate whether you could get halophiles entombed in salts other than sodium chloride. To investigate that, I went to Bulby Mine in Yorkshire. Bulby Mine is 1.4 kilometers deep, making it the second deepest mine in Europe, and there is 250 million year old salt. The salts they mine are primarily halite, which is sodium chloride, and potash, which is potassium chloride and mixed with sodium chloride, and then hydrite, which is calcium sulfate. Crucially for my work, I knew going into this experiment that there were halophilic archaea within the halite and the potash, because Cynthia Norton managed to grow them in 1993. But she didn't mention at the time where, where she got different microbes from the different salts, and that was the first thing I wanted to investigate. So I used modern DNA sequencing techniques to investigate all the microorganisms within the samples. And I found that if you took a sample of halite, sodium chloride, a sample of potash, sodium chloride and potassium chloride, you had exactly the same microorganisms within them. This means that the Martian salts of different compositions might still contain DNA, and you don't need to worry about whether you're going to get something that's not similar to a halophile. I also had this really interesting result, which is that the samples that experienced the most water running through them had less diversity. So if you look at this graph on the right, again, you might need to move the zoom chat, I'm afraid. If you look at this graph on the right, each of these bars in the bar, colors in the bar charts represents a different species of bacteria. And as you can see, the samples that have had the more, the more aqueous modification have fewer species of bacteria within them. So this water that has affected the crystals, this is mainly water that's on the surface that slowly trickled through the geological column over billions of years. This is really interesting because on Mars, of course, we don't have any surface water, which means on Mars we don't have water moving through the geological column, or at least not in this sort of way. Given that these results indicate the thing that has the most impact on destroying evidence of ancient life in the samples is the movement of water, this means that Martian salt crystals might actually be better at preserving ancient life than their terrestrial equivalent. So that's all well and good, but potassium chloride is not especially relevant to Mars. So instead, instead of looking at ancient salt crystals, where I was forced to investigate the compositions of the crystals that naturally occurred, I instead generated artificial crystals in the lab. So these are halophiles. I stuck them in a mixture of sodium chloride with another salt, and I tried to see whether you would get the same number of halophiles surviving if you had other salts in there, if they were being entombed in salts other than sodium chloride. And the ones that are marked in the red boxes are salts that we know are very abundant on Mars. And as you can see from these, this graph, the vast majority of the salts I investigated, all of them except magnesium chloride, could preserve halophiles just as well as sodium chloride could. So Martian salts, looks like a lot of them can preserve ancient life. The one exception to this is magnesium chloride. So magnesium chloride is actually an incredibly toxic chemical. I think what was happening in these experiments was I had to form the salt crystals by making a small puddle and putting halophiles in there. And I think the magnesium chloride in the puddle was killing the cells before the crystals could form. And I reckon that once they're inside the crystal and they're no longer being exposed to magnesium ions, I think they'd probably be okay, but I can't prove this. However, if exophiles do exist, then again, I think you'd get a much higher bar if I used an exophile rather than a halophile. So again, we need to be looking for exophiles. So the other thing I investigated was I mentioned that once you entombed halophiles inside sodium chloride, they were much better protected from the Martian radiation environment than a halophile in the than a halophile on the surface. So I was wondering whether these salts would have the same effect. And actually, I was pretty worried that they wouldn't. But my worries turned out to not be the case. If you took these cells from these sort of salt crystals with containing cells in and bombarded the salt crystals with radiation, I actually found that if you entombed a halophile inside, so inside a salt that wasn't sodium chloride, you got much better survival under the radiation than if you just entombed a sodium halophile in sodium chloride. All the salts I investigated had better radiation protection effects than the new sodium chloride does. The actually really exciting data point in here is the magnesium chloride. As I mentioned, magnesium chloride is toxic and not many cells could survive to get inside the salt crystals. 
Once the cells were inside magnesium chloride, however, they seemed to be completely protected from the radiation. No further cells died when they were exposed to radiation other than the ones that had already been killed from the magnesium chloride. So that's a really interesting result. So in conclusions, astrobiologists study life and habitability. Life from a more habitable Martian past might survive within salt crystals. And that's sort of the big idea, and that's why astrobiologists study halophiles. So I found that sodium chloride and potassium chloride crystals preserve ancient life equally well, and that actually ancient life is preserved better in dry salt crystals, such as the type we get on Mars. I found that lots of different salts that are found on the Martian surface entomb life, although some of these are toxic in solution. So we need to sort of investigate, we need to determine the habitability of the brine that formed the salt crystals, not just the salt crystals themselves. And that it seems that all the salts on Mars provide better UV protection than the salts on Earth. And the one big take home message for this is that astrobiologists need to ramp up the search for exophiles. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Peter. That was great. Um, yeah, really enjoyed the talk. I thought it also really nicely showed um, how science works, like this whole massive picture zoomed out and you really, really honed in and in and in onto your specific issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, astrobiology sounds like a, such a fascinating field, something I'd love to get more involved in. That's very exciting. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, so uh, if anybody does have questions now, um, if you just want to pop them into the chat window, um, and I'll go on to uh, read them out, basically, and try and let like, Peter answer some of them. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I will just address Heather's comment that she's already put in the chat. She's um, just pointed out that Bulby Mine is out Saltburn, which is an interesting name um, in the Middle Ages, as it was a salty stream. Um, Anyway, so while everyone is gearing up and trying to think of some questions and trying to digest this whole big topic, really, <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask one of my own here as well. So I was wondering, after all this, um, are there any concrete plans yet to um, look at Martian salt crystals? And would it even be possible to pack the necessary equipment onto a rover? So there are no concrete plans to generate, to investigate actual um naturally occurring salt crystals on Mars, um, mainly because actually getting to them is still a bit tricky and we don't quite know um, enough about Martian salt crystals to be able to actually concretely investigate them. That said, one of the instruments on ExoMars that I'm really excited about is actually going to take some salt water up to Mars and it's going to investigate, um, no it's not, sorry, it's going to take some salts up to Mars and it's going to try and see if we can get them to form brines on naturally on the Martian surface using this process that forms RSL to try and shed some light on this idea of whether RSL are indeed streams of water that appear, salt water that appear on the Martian surface when the conditions are just right or whether they are some other explanation. We're going to try and artificially make this happen on an instrument on the rover and I'm really excited to see that happen and I hope it works. Yeah, that sounds cool. Thank you. So we've got a question here coming from John, um, who's asking if we can categor categorically say that there's no evidence of life on any asteroids that have landed on Earth. I guess this ties in a bit of the question of um, how life might have um, started as well, right? Yes, so we can't say that. I mean, if actually if we look at the history of... So have I stopped? Am I still there? Yes, I am. Yeah, Sorry. I can still hear you. So if we look at the history of um, our solar system and the history of the Earth, um, and bear in mind that, so there is this thing, this event in ancient uh, planetary history called the Late Heavy Bombardment, which is potentially on the way out, but for the past few decades, it's been considered this big thing that happened when the solar system was relatively young and it got bombarded with asteroids. And actually, if this did happen, life appeared pretty soon after that. So one possibility that people don't talk about too much because it's very difficult to prove, but it's definitely on the cards, is this idea that life on Earth originated from the late heavy bombardment. We've also got this issue that um, ancient Earth, as I mentioned, we have the moon forming impact. This would have made life incredibly hostile, but Mars, on the other hand, seems pretty nice environment. And we do know that you've got asteroids on Earth that are Martian, so there's also the possibility that life didn't originate on Earth. It couldn't survive the late heavy bombardment or it couldn't get going before, I mean, the moon forming impact or couldn't get going before the moon forming impact. 
but life started on Mars and came to Earth in an asteroid. So it is entirely possible. It's just incredibly difficult to actually do any sort of real science with these theories because it's all ancient past. And there's not many fossils or rocks surviving from these sort of periods. And if you say it too much, the Daily Mail pays attention and starts going, loony scientists say life on Earth came from Mars. So it's something that we're aware of, but there's not much we can do with it. I guess, hypothetically, if we did find ancient Martian life and it resembled life on Earth and we could prove that it was ancient, I think that would raise some interesting questions about where life on Earth or Mars originated from. But until we can actually find evidence of ancient life on another planet, we can't say anything. Thanks. Uh, I've got a follow up question to that, actually. Um... I'm just curious if you know if there's any sort of habitability investigations on asteroids in that term. Like, could life even survive on asteroids in the solar um, system? So, um, so asteroids are exposed to the vacuum of space. So in terms of actual, it depends how you define habitability, I guess. If you want life to be active, doing things, then probably not. But... If you want your life to just survive the process, then that's a whole different kettle of fish. We have strapped microorganisms to the outside of the space station for years at a time and then grown them and they've come back and they've not been happy, but they've been okay. Um, there's, um, there is, this is, I know of at least one halophile astro, halophile scientist who's desperately trying to get into astrobiology. He's really trying to push back the limits on how long life can survive inside a salt crystal. Because he makes the case that if your asteroid contains a salt crystal, then this is a very good way of transferring knowledge between even solar systems potentially, transferring, transferring microorganisms, sorry, not knowledge, I don't know where that word came from, transferring microorganisms between planets, between solar systems. So he's very interested in this. And I think he's having a hard time getting people to take him seriously because of the time scales involved, but I think He's onto something with that, actually. I really do. Cool. Um, I'll carry on with one of Ashley's questions. Um, Ashley's asked two questions here. Uh, anyway, one of them is quite nicely in the theme of, um, I guess, looking elsewhere as well, other than Mars. So um, Ashley asks, is Mars the best place to look? What about the icy moons that you did mention in your talk as well? So it depends, again, there's a lot of it depends issues, I'm afraid, but it depends how you're defining the best place to look. I think the icy moons are infinitely more likely to have life, but they're also very far away and they're also got deep layers of ice around them. So Mars is relatively close to us. Um, it's a lot easier to get to than an icy moon. For one, Jovian or, God, I don't know the adjective for Saturn, Cronian mission, you um, can get considerably more Mars missions. I guess also, at least within NASA, there is this sentiment that they have invested so much money into Mars that it seems silly to start the whole thing again on another world, which I can see the argument about. We have only spent 50 years learning about Martian soil and learning how its instruments are going to work, how it's going to work in our instruments. It's going to be a long process if you want to start that on another planet, on another world. Um, I have certainly seen a couple of other people suggest at conferences that we leave Mars to the Americans and maybe the Europeans or the Chinese or the Russians decide to go and look at the icy moon. So these are all options. Um, I think there's also, to be honest, people overlook Venus. Venus is very hostile for spacecraft because it's got acid rain and a very thick atmosphere that crushes things. But it's a lot more similar to Earth than any other planet in our solar system by a long shot. And actually the current environmental conditions of Venus are relatively, relatively short, relatively recent. I think there's also perhaps even evidence that you could get pockets of atmosphere on Venus that are pretty much identical to the atmosphere on Earth. And we have microorganisms in our atmosphere. I only think Venus is a very exciting world for astrobiology that we're overlooking. And also in terms of our understanding of ourselves, Venus in many ways represents Earth in 100, 200 years if you don't sort out this global warming stuff. So Venus 
I think we really should be studying more because it can tell us a lot both about our past and our future. That's really interesting. Thanks. I didn't even know that yeah, Venus would be exciting in any terms of um, search for life. Um, I'm going to quickly ask Ashley's second question as well, which might be a bit quicker. Um, it's just, can I put Martian salt in my fish and chips? I mean, there's nothing stopping you. I'm not sure how good it would taste. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I might stick with the good old sodium chloride. Um, I think that's a safer bet. Um, so Robin asks, um, uh, he says, he thinks you said that Mars's solicited core means it has no magnetic field. And does that therefore mean that Mars has no atmosphere? So does that mean that this is essential because of the protection from radiation or the other effects beside that? Okay, so um, Mars is a very thin atmosphere and this is I mean, to some extent it is because Mars is a smaller planet, which means it had less to start with, but also it is that this lack of magnetic field has made that it's exposed to the radiation of space. And um, sort of what happens, um, you have to accept this as a biologist's explanation of this. So if there's any physicists in the audience screaming at the start trying to explain this, I apologize. But um, the idea is that you get complex, um, molecules in the atmosphere things like ozone things like water they sort of enter the martian atmosphere they sort of float up to the top and then the uv comes through and it chops it up into its constituent atoms and then the lighter ones of these escape off to space because they're too light and the planet's too small and the gravity can't hold them in and so that's very simplified and i might be entirely wrong with the process in that works but we do see this um india's got a mars orbiter that's investigating the water loss from the planet and it can actually see this water vapor coming up to the martian top of the martian atmosphere and then the hydrogen atoms escape off into space so that's basically why mars has lost its atmosphere <laughs> cool thank you um so caroline also has a or says a few points in terms of comparison of uh, Earth and Mars as well. So Caroline had zero knowledge of astrobiology before this presentation and she just wants to say how it was really fascinating but is now even more concerned for Earth um, <laughs> because of the alarming comparison um, and much like Robin she's also intrigued at the thought of us being extremophiles. Um, so Caroline's left wondering what might happen to Mars in the event of a big bang. So I'm not quite sure what she means by that. Is there anything you can say in this respect? Um... Well, I mean, we have evidence of one Big Bang. Um, I, again, that's a more cosmology, cosmology issue. Um, I'm led to believe that Stephen Hawking every now and again would say something about the potential for another Big Bang happening spontaneously is out there. But I think if that was to happen, we'd be dead before we noticed it was happening. <laughs> I yeah, don't know much, much about the cosmological case. issue by the sound of things, that's all right. Um, just while we're on the issue of um, comparisons between Earth and Mars or parallels, um, uh, Bernd brings up a point in the question. So asking, um, just reiterating, did you say that Earth will be like Venus in 100 to 200 years um, without um, any serious fight against okay. climate change? I might have been a bit glib on the time scale, but Venus I mean, Venus is an example of a runaway greenhouse effect. That is what has happened on Venus. That is what the environmental scientists telling, are telling us is a possibility for Earth. I'm not entirely sure of the time scales, but yes, eventually that Venus is, Venus's atmospheric conditions are similar to what's going to happen here if we don't solve it. I'm, not sure the time scales. I think maybe I was being glib by saying a couple of hundred years, but it's but it's definitely once it's somewhere started, in the future. That process it will be very tricky to stop. I guess in that sense it might be, as you said, very promising then if uh, there would still be life possible in some pockets in, <laughs> in this atmosphere. <laughs> uh, great, we've got a quite a different question here from Megan as well. Asks if it's likely that life which has evolved independently on another planet will have RNA or DNA like Earth life, um, or in that sense, looking at um, other forms of rep replicative instructions um, that we might find in alien life that, that we can't even imagine. So how much, I guess, um, 
do we think that alien life might have completely alien replicative mechanisms? I think it has to, well, I think if we're defining alien as completely independent origin, I would say that, yes, I would be, sub, I'd be surprised if nucleic acids turned out to be how it replicates, just because I don't see any inherent reason why that's why we store our genetic code on Earth in nucleic acids, other than it was something that just happened to be there. As I said, we did have a lot of different models for how you could do genetic code without nucleic acids, and we sort of tossed them all away when we discovered DNA, but these models did have science behind them, and in theory they could work, or it could even be weird and other things. To be honest, I would suspect if we found alien life that used nucleic acids, even, not even something separate from DNA or RNA, I would squint at that very heavily, and I would suspect that would be evidence of life traveling between planets, to be honest. I would think nucleic acids would probably be a common origin. Really interesting. So very much unique to Earth's life, or to I wouldn't say unique. shape of life. I'd say maybe. it was chance that that's what we use, and it doesn't necessarily have to be. While we're on this topic, I was wondering myself, actually, as well, um, so I'm guessing people are doing a lot of thought experiments in terms of what might a different replicative instruction be. Do you know if there's any sort of practical applications that people are trying to um, build model organisms that work on an entirely different set of instructions, essentially? Um, I don't know about people actually making biological organisms that replicate using different code. I said there was that image of the artificial nucleic acid that um, has a complicated name that I can't remember. That I think has been spliced into organisms and it works, but it just replicates. It doesn't code for anything at this point. Um, I, well, I don't think anyone's been doing anything like that with biology. However, computer scientists, of course, are making code that replicates itself all the time. So I guess that is the big example of people using replicating code in an industrial setting, I guess. That is the big application of that principle. But yes, I wouldn't be surprised if there are people working on it. I imagine Craig Ventner's probably got a team working on it, but I have not heard anything about it. Anyway, that's great. I guess the, the issue with computer code uh, brings up um, what is life again. And, um, it does indeed. Yeah, and um, maybe we should move on fast before we start shouting about viruses. <laughs> Although I guess the thing about Zoom is we can just mute people if that is <laughs> happening. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just did find that really interesting about the question, what is life? And um, it almost seems as if there's different scales if some people think the universe could have some hallmarks mm. of life and other people say viruses sound the same. Um, yeah, it's just something fascinating I thought of. Yeah. Well, there's a reason people get very interested and passionate about the topic. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Absolutely. I've been to... There's at least one astrobiology conference that happens in a couple of years, actually. That's a conference. It's astrobiologists, so it's biologists, planetary scientists, geologists. But it's also... They also have a bunch of philosophers come and present as well. And actually, I think that's a really interesting way of doing it. And, especially when you're discussing the heady issues of what is life, it is quite useful to have people, philosophers come in and also give their opinions on the matter. Yeah, I can imagine. And bring in a completely new perspective as well. That's great. Um, well, back to the questions that are coming in as well here. Uh, we've got one from Maria, uh, which is in a bit of a um, different sense, I guess. Um, so more about you. So what was the challenge researching an extra topic and um, um, studying with the Open University play into this? Um, so I guess the first two things are separate. They're the separate questions, really. The biggest challenge with researching an extraterrestrial topic, I guess, is being a biologist studying another planet. To some extent, you are limited in what information the physicists, the, the geologists have got. You are not, as a biologist, you are not steering the rovers, though I did get to chat with them sometimes. But you are very much, you get the data you are given and then you try and make what you find on Earth fit into this picture that you are building. Um, but I wouldn't say working with the OU was not a hindrance. I loved being at the OU actually. Um, it's a really interesting campus because of course, 
there's no undergrads on site. It's just um, researchers and admin staff, really. Um, it was really close knit community and I really loved working at the OU and also actually in terms of Asher Marge in particular the OU is very keyed in to the space sector it's one of the best planetary science departments in the country and they well there's not many in the country actually anymore so, which is budget cuts which is a whole other issue but it's a very good department and they're actually they're very very involved in space um yeah, I don't know if you guys still remember the Rosetta probe, which landed on a comet a couple of years back. That had an instrument on it that was built at the OU. And we were very excited when that landed and we had big parties there. And actually the first man-made object to touch the surface of Titan was built in the OU. So <laughs> the OU is a very good place to go if you want to work with planetary science. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, and as and Ashley Brand points just... out, we did have a very good D&D group at the OU as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. That's always nice. Yeah, I was just going to say for to the benefit of everyone else, Anne Grant points out in the chat as well. Um, she uh, works um, within the, um, as, within, with some people in the astrobiology OU department and has put a link there in the chat as well, uh, if anybody is interested. So, um, where were we? We've got another question from Robin, a bit more technical again. Um, he's asking, could you spell out a little about the role of ATP as an essential feature of life here on Earth? And especially nice here being a Cornwall link, um, as Robin recalls the chap that discovered ATP was actually for a while based down here in Cornwall. I should be able to. I did actually do a master's on ATP. <laughs> um, so ATP is a pretty simple molecule. And what's useful about it is that you can um, switch between ATP and ADP relatively, ADP and ATP relatively easily by just taking on an, uh, by adding a prophosphate or taking off a phosphate. And um, basically, you need a way of transferring energy around your body, you can, or even around the cell. You eat at one place. How do you transfer the energy you've gained to the things that the, your mitochondria? for respiration, to your transcriptomic, transcriptomic material to make new proteins. How do you actually get the energy to do this? And the answer to that is that the place in which your cell generates the energy, it gathers the energy, it turns AT, ADP into ATP by jabbing this phosphate molecule onto it. And then this travels around the cell to a different part of the cell and then the different parts of the cell can access this energy by just taking off the phosphate molecule. And by breaking that bond, you're releasing energy, which can then be used to fuel chemical reactions inside the cell. But it's a very, <laughs> it's a very good system. And but as I said, it is just one that evolved very early on Earth. And actually, really interestingly, what I was studying in my master's, which I'm not here to talk about, so I don't too much detail, is that because all life on Earth uses ATP as a signaling molecule, and it's very simple, what you actually had was in these very primitive early seas, you could then get ATP as a signaling molecule, not just as an energy storage molecule. Because if a cell is floating around in a primitive sea, and suddenly ATP concentration is going up, this means something has killed a cell here, this is a dangerous area, and you want to get away quickly. And then from that, you've evolved these whole complicated pure energetic signaling systems, which are all based on ATP as being used as a signaling molecule. And a lot of biologists underlook this application of ATP because we're so used to thinking of it as the energy storage molecule, but actually as a whole host of organisms all around the tree of life that use it as a signaling as well as energy storage. And I think that's really interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah, I've heard ATP described as cellular currency in a way or molecular currency yes <laughs> so i guess it's very interesting too that that can also yeah double as signaling uh, in signaling pathways um do have another question from robin here but before i do that actually i was going to ask one of mine again too um zooming right back to the very start of your presentation you mentioned this bike mission and the bike with the three experiments where in the end two of them were shown that they couldn't even under the Martian conditions. So I was just wondering, what is the experiment that did succeed? What is the one that did show that there was life? If, I don't, if I'm not jogging your memory too much here. <laughs> I want to say that was the labelled release experiment. So the idea of this was that you would um, 
And I might be incorrect on which experiment it was, but I think it was the labelled release, which was this idea that you stuck radioactive carbon into the Martian soil, and then you waited to see whether you got um, radioactive carbon dioxide out of the Martian soil. And if so, this would be indicative that you were getting uh, respiration of some sort of organisms in the Martian soil. And there was, I think they were also looking at chirality because otherwise you couldn't prove that it wasn't um, naturally occurring carbon dioxide, but I might be wrong on that front, but there was attempts to prove that it wasn't um, atmospheric and environmental conditions converting this carbon into carbon dioxide. It was supposed to be um, microorganisms doing it. And if they did detect the radioactive carbon dioxide and they got very excited and then they processed the other results and got less excited. Well, there is, there was a paper only about five years back where one of the authors of the, one of the original creators of this experiment saying he really felt that we should be really looking at these results and he felt that these results showed that Viking had detected life and that we've been ignoring it for too long. And there is, there are definitely are people who suggest that Viking found life on Mars, but it's N of one, and we know the experimental process is flawed. So we need to repeat it. We need to repeat all these experiments and we need to find life on Mars again before we can say we found it. I guess the results are promising enough at least to not stop yes. interest in it and to keep well, Actually, so it's interesting you say that because what about 30 or 40 years after Viking, People just took it as a given. There was no life on Mars. We actually massively ramped down planetary protection. People were like, you don't need to sterilize your rovers anywhere near as much. They're going to Mars. Mars is dead. And then we sort of found out why these other two experiments had failed. And there was a bit of an, oh, we've been a bit hasty in saying Mars has got no life. And that's really why we've seen in the past 20 years or so this sort of re-ramping up of the search for life on Mars. Because for a long time, we thought the issue was settled and that it was Aaron. I see. That's great. Um, yeah, so back to Robin's question that he's put in. Um, as a former social scientist, Robin would love to hear a bit more about what social scientists might be able to add to the field of astrobiology. Okay. So I will admit um, Astrobiology OU has grown a lot since I finished my PhD. Um, at the time I was there, it was just, sci just um, planetary and biology and chemists. We hadn't had the social scientists. So I might be wrong on what they're there why they have joined. But I think the key issues that social scientists need to get involved with in astrobiology is firstly, if we discover alien life, how is this going to change our understanding of ourselves? How is this going to change society? This is going to be a huge deal if we discover alien life. And to some extent, we do need to prepare for this discovery, either the discovery of alien life, or perhaps even more terrifying, the discovery we're alone in the universe. Both of these have huge implications and really we should try and be bracing for that before we get some sort of answer one way or another. On a more practical issue, there's the idea that any attempt to explore Mars, any personed landings on Mars, any crewed missions, they're going to be very long. We do need to sort of work out what this is going to do to the people on their way to Mars, on their way back from Mars, and potentially if Elon Musk is serious in his goal to actually establish colonies on Mars, how that's going to change everything when they're so far away and cut off from their home planet. So there's, yeah, we need to work out how space travel is going to affect the astronauts in those long periods. And if there's colonists, we need to work out how they're going to cope and how they're going to structure their societies. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that's a general um, uh, space faring thing, uh, not just limited to, ast uh, to astrobiology. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Ashley suggested just send Elon Musk to Mars and <laughs> then he can have <laughs> afterwards, uh, which some would say is a good idea. Um, anyway, seeing as questions are trickling in quite slowly at the moment, um, I was going to pick up on something you just mentioned in your answer here. So the premises of discovering that we are alone in the universe. Could we even ever be at a point where we can say conclusively, yes, we know now there's no life out there? Well, I guess you're never going to be able to conclusively say no, we can't. But, I mean, there are worrying indications that there's no one 
there doesn't seem to be any evidence that there's any life out there that is millions of years ahead of us on a technological level. We can sort of imagine the stellar, the feats of stellar engineering we would embark on given enough time and enough scientific knowledge. And as far as we can see, no one in any of the nearby galaxies to us is moving stars around artificially. So that there is potentially so every now and then you get some kind of scientists saying they've detected a potential Dyson sphere, which again they're all very in the low end of probabilities, but that's potentially but if there is alien life in our galaxy, that seems to be the maximum level that anyone has reached. And this is sort of, again, maybe going back to the sociology side of the social science side of things in terms of sort of what civilizations can accomplish given enough time and science. And they're definitely, there's no like Star Trek style Q beings wandering around. There is seem to be, I'm not expressing this very well, but there does seem to be no one is, there's no ancient races around on a massive ancient scale and that seems to be slightly concerning i guess given the age of the universe as ashley points out we have the issue of the great filter which is this hypothesis that um all life eventually that there's some sort of event that stops alien life becoming a massive multi-planetary species and um, he may or may not have passed this and i would argue that actually uh, my assumption would be that there's multiple filters and that in general they represent an inability of life to deal with its own race products. We saw this with the Great Oxygenation event, where oxygen, where life just pumped out oxygen into the atmosphere, and oh, oxygen's really toxic, and life very nearly was killed by this. And I think we're seeing something similar now with carbon dioxide, and I think give it another couple of thousand years, and there'll be some other new race product that we start producing, not realizing that this is what's this is bad for us in the long term. And I think in general. Yes, so in general, our universe, at least in nearby, there doesn't seem to be anyone massively more advanced than us. Um, obviously, we can't start actually saying there's no life out there until we actually start getting out there. However, if we get to the point, so in theory, there are as many planet, as many, there's some people who suggest there's as many habitable worlds out there as there are stars in the sky. And if you start going out to these and we find Earth-like worlds, which don't have life on them. And we keep finding Earth-like worlds that don't have life on them. At some point, you maybe have to draw the line and say, we are very, very rare. And at some point after that, you maybe say, rare enough as make no difference. So, so that was a long yeah. rambling answer to your question. It's something I think about a lot, but I don't have the words to express my feelings on it. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. All these big quests, uh, big picture questions. That's that why we need the social well. scientists. Yeah, exactly. Well. I was going to say that makes that really makes it obvious why um, social scientists can get involved and how um, really big reaching societal questions about ourselves as well, I guess. Um, I'm going to ask a question um, coming from Maria as well here, a bit more um, personal and practical again. So um, about the challenges of research off world and um, whether the access to data is fairly difficult. So you mentioned that it's a lot of the time you just get given a data set and you just have to deal with that. So is there not much, I guess, um, dialogue is either then? So to some extent, I would say the access, the access to data isn't difficult. The NASA is fairly good at releasing their data. Uh, ESA, I believe, is also quite good. Um, yes, in general, at this stage, the scientific community in regards to astrobiology is fairly open in sharing the extra planet data from off-world. I suspect this probably is going to change as we start getting closer and closer to Mars settlements. I think nation states are going to guard this knowledge a lot more closely. Um, but I think for now, everyone is sort of all in this together and they're yeah, so getting the data, you don't really, you can access all the data relatively easily. It's um, understanding the data is actually problematic because if you're a biologist, you've suddenly been reading through these 
geology and chemistry papers and your mind is melting and you don't understand what all the numbers mean. And that's why I think one of the things Astrobiology OU did phenomenally well was it was very much a multidisciplinary group. And so you always had chemists around to explain things to and conversely you can then explain the biology back to them. And I think that is what you need for Astrobiology is you need to be multidisciplinary and you need to collaborate outside of biology. On another level, of course, you are getting the data from these space agencies. I have had at least one person suggest to me that I've got all this, that all this data has been fabricated. I'm a fool for believing it. And NASA's giving me data that makes me think the world is round when it's obviously flat. And that was a painful conversation. So yes, you, you don't get to choose what the data you have from other planets is, and you don't get to gather that data. But I trust the data and it's relatively easy to access. <laughs> yeah. Do you get into it as well where you need to try and interpret data that was actually collected for a different reason? or Yes, very much so. Else? There's a lot of trying to reinterpret data. Or you also you look at some of these papers and you, why haven't they mentioned this? This is the big question I want to know about this. That's because they're a chemist and they don't care about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess that's again where the um, cross-disciplinarity -dis comes as really yeah. comes in handy then. I think we are increasingly seeing, we are seeing astrobiologists and biologists in general working in the space agency and sort of saying, we would like to get some of this data while you're out there. So hopefully, as astrobiology grows, we're going to get more of a say in what data gets connected, and we're also going to have more of a say in how this is interpreted in the public and explained, so you have to do less working out yourself. Yeah, so I guess that would be great to get some um, sort of purposely collected data as well <laughs> reinterpreting so that's levels. why i think ECS xmrs is so interesting is this is i believe it is officially it is the first astrobiology focused mars landing because viking was in the 70s and it was called xenobiology back then so this is exciting because this is the first one that's actually going out there and gathering data looking for evidence of life and how you'd get life surviving on Mars and that's its main goal and that's of course what's named after Watson and Franklin who discovered the structure of DNA. Cool thank you. Um, so we've got another very big picture question I guess from Robin here with a bit <laughs> of a um, social scientist spin again. Um, whether the study of astrobiology in itself uh, might have led to any new thinking or new perspectives on nature or evolution of, of us of life on earth? Um, God, what is the answer to that? Um, so astrobiology as a field, astrobiology as a concept, I guess, it's a relatively young field. I think a lot of this work we've done on origin of life studies and stuff, the people who discovered them would now, on the modern framing, would consider themselves astrobiologists or at least tangential to astrobiology, but I think because of the youth of astrobiology as an actual overriding con top-down concept and sort of grouping in the scientific hierarchy, I think it probably, a lot of people who have made discoveries of understanding are astrobiologists, but I'm not sure astrobiology itself has driven those discoveries, if you see what I mean. Yeah, but I guess there are definitely lots of parallels in terms yes. of and then with working with a world in completely different conditions. Yeah. There's obvious parallels to the world. Yeah, there's a lot of synthetic biologists are very exciting, at, excited at the prospects of what life we could get on other planets, and they're heavily involved in this and sort of the whole bottom up origin of life stuff is they're very into the field. <laughs> um, we've got another question from Megan. When you won. Ash sites just on sort of an astrobiology, the other big hot topic debate. Viruses people fight about for hours. The other one, of course, is what came first, the um, genetic code or the cell casing. And that again, I have seen conferences get into astrobiology conferences get into pretty heated and sometimes not entirely good natured debates on the subject. <laughs> so this is so yes, the origin of life stuff and these understanding of our ancient history, this is all tied in with astrobiology, even if it's not astrobiology related, and they're very much part of our field, even if it's not the work that they're actually doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> yeah, so uh, back to the question Megan had as well then, um, about interested in, is there much interest at all in attempting to colonize plants with microbes from our planets, such as like streamophiles, to see if they could survive? Um, or is it, I guess, more the other way, because you did mention um, sterilizing rovers and things mm. like that, that people deliberately try not to do that. So at the moment, the policy is we don't want to contaminate other worlds with terrestrial life. Um, this is, um, this is, there are the ethical reasons for that, but then there's also the scientific concerns of we, if this is a pristine world that's got its entire separate ecosystem we don't want to just blunder in there and trash it before we can study it um i would suggest and i'm not speaking as any sort of scientist or professional but i would suggest that if it does look as if there's not many species out there in the universe if life on earth is rare we might have a moral imperative to seed the galaxy with life but I would definitely, that's me speaking on a personal level and not on a scientific level. I guess that's another one for the philosophers. <laughs> so, yeah, that's another one for the philosophers. But oh, I think it does, if life is out there, we don't want to destroy it. But I feel the converse is also true. If life isn't out there, we probably should be trying to spread it. Yeah. It's great how these sort of questions pop up from all angles where you do <laughs> realise how philosophy and social science plays into it. Um, mentioning social science again, Robin asks um, with a sinister grin if it would be advisable to have a few epidemiologists involved um, within astrobiology. Yes, so I think so I think there's a lot well as of yet we have not taken any samples from other planets back to Earth deliberately. There has been asteroids from other planets that have hit the Earth, and NASA has been promising that they will be sending samples back from Mars within the next 10 years for the past 60 years. So it's on the cards as a possibility. And to be honest, since the question of is there life on Mars has sort of opened up again, the idea of, oh, we could contaminate the Earth has risen again as an issue. I think this isn't as big a concern as people worry about because we have an established environment here on Earth. As I mentioned, Earth, life on Earth does exist in an extreme environment that has lots of oxygen. So alien life, Mars, life on Mars to get back here this would not be a nice environment for Martian life. It wouldn't survive especially well. So that's on Earth in general. I think if we did find life on Mars, I think we'd be spending a lot more money trying to get it to actually survive on Earth than trying to stop it surviving on Earth. Then there's also the issue of actually, from a pathological viewpoint in epidemiology, how's it going to know how to bypass a terrestrial immune system if it's never encountered anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on that note, actually, um, I've heard of some really interesting research at the Exeter on Exeter's main campus. There's a group looking, or someone within a group looking at if peptides found on asteroids and single amino acids, so that can't be found on Earth, but have been recovered from asteroids, if they can even elicit an immune response. Um, yes, I've seen which that. Which seems in some cases to do. Yeah, and even so, that's an example of you get peptides that they exist in nature, they work fine, but we don't have them on Earth, so terrestrial life doesn't use them. But on an alien world, those peptides might be common, some of the ones we have on Earth might be rare, and so we cannot assume that life on Earth will use the same, so even if they use peptides and proteins, they could still be very different to what we have here. Yeah. Yeah, so the questions to the chat seem to have slowed down now, apart from um, just some more comments on in terms of um, social science and astrobiology. Um, I do have a last question I did want to ask as well, um, which is, I guess, a bit more personal again. I was wondering, how does this relate to your research now? Is there anything, any themes of astrobiology that you like so, to bring into it? Actually, uh, from a theory standpoint, it doesn't. Um, I have two big scientific passions, I guess. One of them is astrobiology, as you can tell. 
The other is social evolution and the rise of complex social systems in primitive organisms like microorganisms and ants and bees and stuff. And sort of my hope is that one day I'll have my own lab and I'll be able to combine these two disparate fields into a single thing. But for now, I'm just trying to sort of try and find work in one or both of these areas and work and hopefully ride one of them to a career that I can merge them. That said, while the theory on the polyneastrobiology isn't especially relevant to my current work, the techniques are massively relevant. Um, that's the advantage of doing a science PhD, I guess, is that you learn all these useful techniques. Um, in particular, actually, just recently, um, there was, during lockdown, uh, we couldn't get into the lab. So um, we had this data set that a um, student that was, uh, that's what a postdoc that was working on lab generated a couple of years ago. And this was a complex uh, microbial community data set. Um, and it had been very complicated and she had not really worked with that before. And she didn't really know what to do with this data set and had just sort of sat on the back burner for years. But this was actually very similar to the data set I've done in my PhD. If you recall that big bar chart I showed with all the different bars, that was a very similar principle. And so I was able to use these techniques to learn through my PhD and apply them to just sort of spend a good month or so, couldn't go to the lab, just sort of grinding down on this data and making it work and understanding it. And actually we are planning to publish that now. So while the theory is very different, the actual day-to-day -day practical techniques, they're pretty similar no matter what lab you're in. You're always going to be useful to have some understanding of modern genetic sequencing techniques, have good microbial culturing techniques, to know how to growth bizarre things on bizarre materials these yeah, are of course. useful everywhere in the field sounds like your ideal trajectory would really be if they discovered huge swathes of bees or ants on mars with, <laughs> yeah with microbial pathogens so, actually there was this really interesting study that i don't think well i don't think anyone's picked up on this result and actually maybe i shouldn't be saying it on the zoom but there is this idea that if i remember they I mentioned they stuck microbes on the outside of the space station and then took them back to Earth. And if you actually look into those data sets, you see that there does seem to be a tendency that the microbes that survived the best this environment were the more social ones, the ones that were able to cooperate with each other to survive the, marsh, the space conditions. And so then you're getting into the question of, okay, on Earth, we tend to see a trend of organisms becoming more social and more cooperative as time goes on, sort of Molecules cooperate to form cells, cells cooperate to form beings, bees cooperate to form hives, uh, ant colonies cooperate to form super colonies. This does seem to be a general tendency. And if life does come potentially from outer space on asteroids, and this is going into very speculative, then potentially this is where we've got this tendency for life to cooperate in sort of small groups. And groups to cooperate with each other. That's the only way you can survive the vacuum of space. It's really interesting. Yeah. So, so I have got an idea of how I would merge the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are obviously thinking about it a lot. <laughs> um, Robin just got a couple of um, last-minute questions in as well about um, Franklin and Franklin as a research opportunity. If you've got a lot of competition, if astrobiology has a lot of competition there, so who else might? Um, hope for um, some new crucial data from so i am failing to import franklin this um um i think he means the um the, oh, it wasn't franklin the new mission you mentioned yeah so i'm so used to think of it as a full isa xmr wasn't a franklin just franklin <laughs> so if there's any other subjects and studies that you're that astrobiology uh, yes. might so be in a way competing isa xmr wasn't a franklin that i am very interesting, mainly perfectly good ESA, that's a European project, and also it's astrobiology related. But of course, it's not the only thing. Um, we've got InSight, which took a very long time to be launched and get to Mars, but that landed within the last year. I couldn't say exactly when, but they have already discovered that Mars does seem to have sort of small earthquakes, Mars quakes, and that's a very exciting thing. And it's going to continue investigating the deep Martian geology. And this is stuff that we've never been able to do before. So that's really interesting. And then, of course, NASA is following up Curiosity in the next few years. We've got Perseverance is going to be landing. I don't think they've announced the full instrument suite for that yet. But I think, again, this is going to be really interesting. And especially NASA has shown with the past few rovers that they've gotten really good at generating really interesting data. So while I don't know 
what data they're going to be generating with perseverance, I'm really looking forward to seeing it and how it changes our understanding of astrobiology.